On this episode of DC On Screen, we are talking about the final Black Adam trailer and a couple of other news bits before reviewing Netflix's Sandman. All that right after these messages from our mystery sponsors. Welcome into DC On Screen. This is the podcast that discusses the DC Comics multiverse on film and television. I am your host, David C. Robertson, and this, the man who once made a beer run while holding a large alligator, Jason Goss. That was... I don't know where you found that footage. (laughs) And to be fair, I got both the beer and the alligator home safely. You posted it on TikTok. It was a wild night. I've also forgotten the TikTok password. You just kept yelling, gator run, gator run. That's probably the TikTok password, actually, now that you say it. Gator run? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gator run 22 or some shit. (laughs) <laughs> it's been a minute since i thought about it <clears throat> all right well um <laughs> we're cranking one out a, a mere week after we have released another episode so that i'm kind of unprecedented uh <laughs> in the, for, for this year anyway <laughs> it's been a it's been a weird run yeah uh quick Quick thank you to the uh, patrons. $1 a month uh, gets you every episode ad-free. And $5 a month uh, gets you that, plus whatever the hell else we uh, wind up putting out there. Um, If you've clicked on this uh, episode, I would assume you want to hear our our thoughts on Sandman. And I am trying to get together a review of the graphic novels with Scott of uh, DC Squadcast. So... um, Hopefully those will be up. We'll start being put up soon. If we can, we can get some time. We're all busy. We're all very busy adults. Yeah. Doesn't that suck? It does. Yeah. He's it got does. three kids. You've got one kid. Yeah. Uh, in a way, I wish all of this had happened in our like twenties. Yeah. I've got a bad back, time, which is kind of like a kid. Yeah. But you had that same back in our twenties. So that wouldn't have helped. That's true. That's true. Actually, I think I, I have more time now. <laughs> <laughs> I Possibly. did in my twenties, actually. <laughs> I'm married, so I'm not like scouring, you know, dating websites or right, you know, right. talking up ladies or whatever. Actually I never did that in the first place. It was really more of just like a lot of hours spent quietly longing in the corner. Right. Just yeah. just you know, just sad, quiet yearning. No, even if your twenties had been in twenty twenty two, you I don't think you would have been a tender user. No, I don't think so. I don't that know what that would be. That doesn't feel like me. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what I'd do either. I'm. I'm not good at dating. Yeah, like, I think I would have to work up. It would. I would. If I had not gotten married, I think I probably wouldn't have tried Tinder until I was in my forties. Because <laughs> then it would just be like, screw it. I don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. Here's my entire <laughs> Tinder profile in my forties. Is anyone else as desperate as me? Could we just like hang out, chill, watch some stuff and lay around together. I'm not looking for much. Just right. Basic companionship. I mean, my, MySpace also most used to, Beatles. my, my profile back in the early aughts used to say something to the effect of, I'm not looking for sex, just a literate companion. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, if you can read this, you're qualified. <laughs> and, and you know, Oh no, no. I never I never found a, any kind of date off of MySpace. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, I'm sure. Uh, well, anyway. Tom Tom was there for you though. He was always my friend. Mm-hmm. Let's get to this final Black Adam trailer. I God I have damn, been yes. on I have been on on the record as saying I am I am not excited about this movie. I don't care. I want to care, but I don't. This final trailer, man, I'm I'm sold. <laughs> I I was on record telling you just wait for the next trailer. Yes, you. Yes, absolutely. This is why you're here. <laughs> I get caught up in my feelings, man. And then like, I need you, you know, logically sitting there going, there's a always second. a tone shift on the second trailer. Yeah. Comedy to drama or drama to comedy. It doesn't matter. It, there's always a tone shift. I know. I did the same thing with the Batman where I'm like, ah, the lame, this is a the lot cat of cats joke. thing. Yeah, yes. Yeah. But you know, here we are. I'm excited again. Black Adam trailer. 
Uh, we start off with a Man of Steel tribute in the water, and uh, you can't tell me that's not a Man of Steel tribute. <laughs> it's like a silhouette of him, like, like floating in some damn water. Like, yeah. yeah, come on, that was Man of Steel all over. Like, I had to stop and be like, "Wait, what trailer am I watching again?" <laughs> <laughs> Although now that you pointed out, I, I haven't actually compared the two images. I I saw mm-hmm. the homage, but I haven't thought about the actual silhouette part. Hmm. <sighs> Pretty sure Dwayne Johnson could like bench press Henry Cavill. I mean, maybe. I think he's got a good four or five inches on him. Maybe. I'm kind of curious about that. He might not be able to. He, he might not be able to touch Henry Cavill since Henry Cavill is like you know possibly going over to the MCU now. Oh, he may, but not this weekend. He's not, according to the news. No, there's. Nothing proactively casting him in the news this this weekend, as far as I can tell. <laughs> I just keep seeing all sorts of stuff. Like he's gonna play Doom. He's gonna be Victor Von Doom. Damn it! Yeah, he actually would make a good Doom, but <laughs> yeah, um, he'd make a good whatever. He's a good actor. Personally, I really like the idea of you know him being the evil Superman of the uh, of the Marvel universe. Mm. That whole rumor, the Hyperion thing. Yes, Hyperion. I was like, what the hell was his name again? <laughs> like, it just went right out of my head. Hyperion, yeah. The old Superman? Yeah. I get it. I get it. I mean, I would probably dig him wherever he showed up over there if he's going to show up. I'm, I'm good with it. But, um, yeah, I just, I'm not sold yet. I, I think there were a lot of people thinking it was going to happen. It was a speculation wave mm-hmm. that had no real resting place. I don't know. We'll see, man. Uh, anyway, this was right. Four inches, six, one and six, five. Hmm. So I love that. He thinks that he feels like uh, black Adam feels like his powers are a curse and they have that whole like dialogue there. More in voice in voice. in yeah. in voiceover about like, you can either, you know, be the earth's doom or his salvation or whatever. Um, none other than fate. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and you got to admit, when, when that dude tells you that, you should probably take it seriously. I mean, Dr. Fate tells you something, you should probably take it seriously anyway. <laughs> if he tells you to, to choose a certain type of taco at a truck, yeah, grab it. And you're like, you know, but I don't like cilantro. Do it. Okay. But no one it's get the taco. <laughs> yeah. I love that Amanda Waller is calling the shots for the JSA. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I love that connective tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that doctor. I, okay. Th- that freaking, that plane that the JSA are going to underneath their, their headquarters looks like the javelin from the justice league cartoons. Mm-hmm. First of all, <laughs> uh, I love that they're trying to like negotiate for black Adam's peaceful surrender. And he's like, uh, Black Adam kneels before no one. I'm what? not peaceful, and I do not surrender. Yeah, that was badass. Loved it. <laughs> uh, Fuck both of those. There should just be a lot of middle fingers in this. Also, I love mm-hmm. the. I I've genuinely loved scenes where like the landscape departs. Like even in the X Men days, landscape just oh, yeah, sure. be damned, and some shit rises out of it. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, uh, same as in like the BVS days. mm Hmm. Oh, he's gorgeous. Love that trope. Yep. I do too. I shouldn't because it's kind of tired. Oh, it's nonsense. But I, I do love, love it. it. It's gorgeous every time. <laughs> yeah. Every time I see it, I think of um, the old Mitchell and Webb look a sketch where like uh, he's playing the, the Bond villain and he's trying to get his new headquarters in in line and he's got the contractor there and he's right, like, right, right. I want, I want this wall to spin on its axis. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, that's not going to work, mate. That's a load bearing wall. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Also, you can't have a fireplace in that like that. You spin the wall, just room will fill up with smoke. (laughs) It's a beautiful sketch. (laughs) Yes, it is. Um, That's a good one. Um, If anyone would at any point want to ask us what our top 10 Mitchell Webb uh, sketches are. Oof. I have suggestions. I uh, yeah, I don't know what any of them are called, but also I, watch I, any ten of them, any of you, for God's sake, if you haven't seen them. I mean, you'd have to do the inebriati. That'd be yeah, that'd be included. 
Yeah, I mean, there Easy. there are several. Like I, Vectron's knees. <laughs> the best man speech. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the best man's speech. Goddamn, the best man's speech is amazing. <laughs> the atheist uh, watermelon. I'm not disagreeing. I love Prosecco. <laughs> anyway, so we yeah, we knew that. Almost, it, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So we knew the inner gang was was involved in this movie, and I knew I knew. Sabak was, or Sabak, however you say his name, was going to be the villain because um, I, I, I've seen the McFarland figures. Mm. And Sabak is a uh, guy named Ishmael Gregor, and he was the leader of Inner Gang. And uh, he winds up getting possessed by a demon. And looks like that's all there. He looks deadly comic book accurate. Um, so I'm sure the JSA and Black Adam will have to team up and try to take him down i had no recognition until you uh until you told me but like is that the same guy that kills martian manhunter at some point i don't remember i don't remember that i know the whole uh, infinite start no uh, it was one of the like crisis intervals the only thing i remember is that like martian manhunter going crazy and um and he's like giant size he's like a freaking godzilla (laughs) and (laughs) And then Batman like points out to Plastic Man, no, literally, you are the only person who can stop him. Mm-hmm. I remember that, and like Plastic Man like leaving the note for his kid, and because he thinks he's gonna die. <laughs> no. Yeah, that was a good moment. Mm-hmm. So I love that we got to see Doctor Fate's like, what do you call it? It's like a well, it's an onk, but it's an onk shaped projection of his power or whatever Mm -hmm. that's like classic fate i'm just very pleased with this trailer and i I love that they they have kept the the one shot in it that i've loved in every trailer was which is the uh the planes flying up beside black adam and him just like looking over and then just like punching the planes wing off (laughs) but yeah I'm, i'm very pleased with this you have any more thoughts on the trailer? I do like that the one guy in that plane, as always, <laughs> eats himself immediately. Oh, yeah. 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 Get the hell out of there. And I'm surprised the other plane doesn't just pull off as fast as possible. Yeah, I would. God damn it, I would. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's terrifying. <laughs> this, this dude just decided to, um, you know, punch a plane. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would literally pull away and my inner thought would be, well, I'm not prepared for this. (laughs) (laughs) There was no training. I'm not going to even try to improvise. I'm out. Yeah. He's just got, it's just, you know. That man just punched that plane. Holy grail, man. Run away. Run away. (laughs) Run away. Thousand percent. I'm, I'm out. I'm done. Yeah. But yeah, the shots were fantastic. I'm I'm deeply excited about it. And uh, holy shit, he looks like a badass. Even even the scene in the uh, whatever this hell uh, this cave is that uh, what you know the teaser from a couple of years ago. Yeah, um, where magic is weak. Yeah, even <laughs> that got expanded into something that was even more fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, like I don't, I actually don't know what he does to that dude. You know, uh, hilariously enough, that he puts in the rocks. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, um, but that dude did not appreciate it. I will, I will go out on a limb and say that he straight noped him. Yeah, he's um, he's done. Yeah, that that dude's that dude's not seeing his grandchildren. Yeah, that guy's not picking up milk at the store tonight. Mm 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 mm. It's over. <laughs> So we and got then we some, have the Amanda Waller mm-hmm. thing, like oh God. yeah, I do love the Amanda Waller Hawkman connection of like if you find me the right cage, and, you know, we'll put him in, and then he gets his ass handed to him in like seconds. Yeah. Also, deeply love his mask, like pulling down like it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I I just there's a lot of this I'm gonna love. Yeah. I'm excited, dude. Hawkman's mace spins. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, not I when you grab him midair because right. you're. <laughs> A fucking god, but short of that, yeah, that's badass. I mean, I saw it spin and I went, <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm excited to see like Adam Smasher just grab Black Adam and put him between his hands. Uh huh. And just sort of like, yeah, you know, have his hands expelled. You know, it, it doesn't matter at that point. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 bizarre to me, but sometimes a really great trailer can do that to you, where you're just like, I don't give a shit about this movie. Okay, I'm down. <laughs> I'm I'm down and I'm excited. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Happens that simply. It can happen quick, man. So if you're ever listening to my show, or your, our show, I should say, or any of my shows. My good bitch. Yes. My good bitch. Our show. Yes. I mean, it's our show, but I meant my shows. Shows that I am a part of. Mm. Help. <laughs> <laughs> you do like 14 shows. It's fine. <laughs> I do. Uh, if you're listening to one of my shows and you go, this guy's too negative. Just wait. Mm-hmm. There's no telling what will actually happen. I, I go through cycles. Yeah. You might go positive. You also might go deeply negative. Yeah. You just I don't know, know either. You just never know. Mm-hmm. Some might uh, ascertain that it's a medication situation. <laughs> it's not. I get put off. <laughs> and then I fall in love. Or I fall in love and then I get put off later. You just never know with me. I've been there. Yeah. I sour from time to time. <laughs> sure. You done. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so we reported last week that Dan Lin was in talk, was in talks to be um, the new Kevin Feige of the DC universe. Uh, he has removed himself from that. <laughs> Them negotiations broke down y'all. Mm-hmm. And uh, only other piece of news we actually have before getting into the Sandman Um we talked about how uh, Jordan Elsass left Superman and Lois. He'll no longer be playing Jonathan Kent. He's stepping away from acting. And um, they have replaced him. Michael Bishop, uh, who played, uh, let's see, he, he, he starred as DJ Maz in the Disney original movie Spin. <laughs> okay. I mean, I didn't know the other guy before either, so who cares? Like, he looks nothing like Jordan Elsass. Lovely. Perfect. But he does look like the comic book version of Jonathan Kent. Of John Kent. Hmm. Super. <laughs> so that's weird. He actually looks like the character Jordan on Superman and Lois. Which I still can't stop calling Lois and Clark, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. I wonder what they'll do. How they'll, how they'll do it. I'm also or just always like, confused but like, when somebody steps away. Like, It's either for really good or really bad reasons. Typically bad. Yeah. I think he was just, I think it was just too much. I think he was just done. I think he was burnt out and tired, the way it seems. Yeah. The way part. he talks about it. Well, I, I feel like it's always three reasons. One, you're stepping away before the other shoe drops and people, you know, news outlets explain what you did. Mm-hmm. Um, two, you're just sort of, I don't know, overwhelmed by the work mm-hmm. and about to have a nervous breakdown. And then three, you just sort of find that your life is not going to be this and, and you just want to find another place for yourself. Well, you know, the, the news outlets were already like down his throat so hard they were coming out of his dick because mm. like, they were like, they're recasting him after he doesn't show up to set. Like he just no called no show, you know. Yeah, I and then it turned out like he was like, yeah, no, I'm. I just I I informed them that I wasn't going to be doing the show anymore because I just can't. And he doesn't even know if he's going to keep acting, you know. And we've we've heard Rosenbaum and uh, Welling talk about the, those hours, man. No, oh, they're rough. Well, the hours so, and the, you know displacement geographically, yeah. like they add up. It's like sixteen twenty hour days, you know, like. Good God. Well, you know, 20 hour days and a whole other country sometimes. Yeah. Where you're like, I get it. I mean, granted it's, it's adjacent, but like, yeah, sometimes you have people that are like spending, I don't know, four or five months of their year every year outside of their family. And yeah, some people that's okay. Some people it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, you know, I wish them the best man. Wish, wish Jordan the best. I don't know what else to say. I hope this new kid can cut it, because I'll be examining him, be running him over with a fine tooth comb. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like Jordan wouldn't have done that. Why isn't your hair blonde? 
Mm-hmm. And curly. <laughs> well, you didn't have the curly hair. It was wavy. Yeah. Those kids actually got curly-ish hair. <laughs> All right, so that tracks. New kid. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Can you well, also destroy things with a touch? Well, this is the guy playing John, not not Jordan. So. I don't know. John doesn't have powers yet on this show. It's just one of those superpowers that I've always um, been fascinated by because it's kind of silly, and no one seems to really like pick it up as an like an overt thing. Mm-hmm. That like Superboy used to be able to just dismantle things by touching them. Yeah. Kind of the opposite of his <laughs> of his dad, who apparently can do structural engineering and civil engineering in his sleep, just with mm-hmm. his eyes. Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna hold this up and weld concrete because that's a thing that exists. Yeah. Uh, you, you can, know, you can definitely just melt concrete into being sound again. Silver Age is the Silver Age, man. No, no. Ever, you know, the the Super Family did all sorts of wacky shit. Mm-hmm. I mean, ba- I, my favorite has always been like Superman just, you know, like opening his hand and like tiny Superman flying out of his palm. Oh, the tiny Superman! I I wish every day I had that. Well, yeah, naturally, those would be the best action figures. Yeah. Hey, bro, right. I'm gonna sit here in this chair. Can you go uh, do the dishes for me? Mm-hmm. Of course, mine would turn against me. They would be like the little mini ashes from Army of Darkness, just like coming after me with forks and tying me down like Gulliver's Travels, you know? <laughs> 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 I think with that, we're going to go to break. And when we come back, we'll talk about Netflix. Netflix's Sandman, that I can't say. Yep. Netflix's Man Man. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, and we're back from break, ready to talk about The Sandman on Netflix. I assume you've seen it, right? You've you've watched the show? Yeah, and some episodes a few times. Okay, okay. You did see that 11th episode, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure. I guess we should. I should have made sure of that before the show, but you didn't stop me when I said, hey, let's do that Sandman review. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it was there. And, uh-huh. um, I rewatched a few episodes. That included. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you guys. This, for me, this is pretty much going to be a gush fest. <laughs> Good start. I, I don't have a, a single solitary damn problem. Mm-hmm. With anything they did, save for per- perhaps, I would say I kind of wish that one, his hair had been a little more Edward Scissorhands, and two, I wish he he'd had the star in his the stars in his eyes a little more. That's all I got. Like, and I get why they didn't do either of those things. And even then, you know, you're you're reaching. Like, yeah, that's like if I'm absolutely trying to find a problem. Yeah. Because honestly, I think this <laughs> this Sandman show, um, it feels like Neil Gaiman went back to a thing he did 30 years ago, which is exactly what happened, mm-hmm. and said, oh man, I was so young and so worried I wasn't going to be able to fill up a comic book. Mm-hmm. Let me cut, up, uh, cut out all this superfluous bullshit that made no difference and make the story super tight. <laughs> Which cracks me up because it's also the kind of story that cannot be super tight. It's so like, yeah, it 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 has so many tentacles. It has many tentacles, but like I know you haven't read the 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 graphic novels, Mm-mm. and I have. Like I well I several years ago back in college, um, uh, basically my my. Uh, obsession there for a little while was getting super stoned and reading Sandman. And I can get behind that. Yeah. And it was like one of these giant additions. Like I was dating this girl. Um, one of her friends lent her a Sandman 
volume is like this huge omnibus thing that in like 2000 this is like 2007 by the way Mm -hmm. so i I, it had like issues like one through 30 something you know and i i read that shit like there was no tomorrow now i didn't remember much that's why i went back and started reading before sandman came out before the show came out but there is there is a lot of like like a lot of little sidebars where like, as I was reading the comics again in preparation, I felt like, well, that was a weird aside. Like, I don't understand that. Like, not that I didn't understand it. It was just like that, that had no place in this story. Like, um, for instance, in, um, in the Constantine, um, bit where the, in the, in the, in Constantine's ex's house, mm-hmm. there's all this, there's this whole like little sidebar where this guy like who has like a really nice job and does this thing, like breaks into people's houses for thrills, breaks into the house and winds up touching the walls and goes into like a dream state and the dreams begin eating him alive. And all that ever happens is like when Constantine and Morpheus show up, they're like, Hey, look out for that human. And Constantine's like, ah, what's that about? And dreams like, ah, he's the dreams are eating him alive. That's it. Never see that guy again. <laughs> no, but uh, it's, you know, uh, given the series, it's a pretty popular MO for serial killers. You know, you start with a little bit of invasion and maybe some light robbery. And then next yeah. thing you know, eh, they got a hand. But that's fine. That's fine. But it just had it served no purpose other than, you know, giving a little bit of danger to like, don't touch the walls because this girl's dead father, she's like the, the, you know, the sand or some, whatever has like splattered his entire body all over the walls. And is he still alive somehow? And, but touching him will turn you, I don't know. It was, there was some weird stuff in there that just, it just didn't matter. You know, there's a, and there's a lot of that. Like, um, Oh my God. One of the best things they did for the, in this show is they cut out the DC universe. And I had no idea I was going to feel that way, (laughs) but especially like reading the books, it's just so weird. It's like, you know, like, uh, he goes to hell and instead of it being like the giant demon that leads him there, Mm -hmm. it's like Intrigan Mm. and you know, it's just like, okay, well that's weird. And then like, sometimes he goes and he, he, he goes and he talks to uh, Martian Manhunter for a minute and that, you know, all of the, like the DC stuff feels really weirdly shoved in and i was glad like i read this thing where Neil gaiman was talking about how he took he basically just like started whittling off of anything dc of referencing anything because he like there's a bit in the comics where he's got um john d the guy that has the stone Mm -hmm. in the show in the book he's dr destiny Mm. who fought the justice league and uh, he always had that little that little stone, and and he was like the Lord of Dreams or whatever he thought he was. And, and then it turns out he's in Arkham Asylum, and he's talk he keeps talking to Scarecrow, who's like just being ridiculous and like trying to scare the guards by hanging himself. Of course. <laughs> and like Gaiman wanted the Joker there, and then they were like, "Oh yeah, sure." And then like at the last minute, they were like, "Oh hey, it can't be Joker." And he's like, why? Oh, um, he, he died in a river mm. <laughs> and, and Gaiman's like, yes. And it's Joker. So he'll be back like in a month. They're like, yeah, but right now he's dead. <sighs> no, it <laughs> has to be like three weeks. Who the hell cares? Yeah. Right. And he's like, well, okay. In this timeline, he's, uh, he's still a lot. No, it's, it can't be a joke. Okay. So like he slowly just started moving or quickly really started moving away from DC stuff. But it, I love how it, it just cuts all that horse shit out. And just really makes the show uh, sing on its own. Like I, like I've seen, I saw a lot of people being like, "How is it going to work without DC stuff?" Uh, perfectly. Yeah, it'll it'll be fine. I mean, the show much, itself much, is about God and the Devil way more than it is DC. Yeah, and uh, frankly, given the show as it laid itself out, DC is absolutely irrelevant. Honestly, it was irrelevant in the books. Probably as I've been rereading them, I'm just like, my God, there's really no reason for any of the DC stuff being here. Yeah. It really isn't 
Like, I mean, I love the crossovers as much as they can be done. Yeah, I mean, and, it, you, know, you know, Constantine showing up in any form or fashion, always, always pleasant. I, yeah, but Joanna Constantine is fine. Is wonderful. Yeah, of course. Um, of course, but like, eh, it it wouldn't be the end of the world if uh, DC showed up or if the right characters did show up in that context. It, it's it's its own environment. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And, and, you know, there was, I don't want to harp on the books too much, but, you know, there was some weird stuff involved where it's like, Dream is like, I don't know this League of Justice. And I'm like, you're the god of dreams. You probably should somehow <laughs> know that, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's irrelevant for Dream. Um, but um, actually, one of my favorite things in the book is that um, while Morpheus is uh captured and in that bubble um and everyone's having all these sleeping problems uh that's that's how sandman the golden age sandman he dreams of morpheus in some way or another and becomes inspired <laughs> oh, he, he gets to run around with his little gun yeah yeah putting people to sleep yeah but yeah man uh so here uh, i loved how they fixed the ravens because in the comics, the Ravens don't come into it until like volume two or so. Mm-hmm. And it's very much a situation of looking back at the previous stories and asking yourself, well, why weren't there any Ravens trying to help dream while he was imprisoned? If cause Neil hadn't thought of them yet, but, <laughs> and then I did like, as they when they were, when they were talking about doing the show, I was like, I gotta wonder how they'll, they're going to like manage all of the exposition because like Morpheus has <laughs> like, you know, tons of exposition bubbles mm-hmm. <laughs> and i love that they brought in like matthew the raven way early and had him be the audience proxy so that way morpheus can say all of that stuff to matthew the raven it's just very well done is is v- well, shockingly I mean, well done the entire story of the raven in that show is heartbreaking and then heartwarming like the initial raven and it's uh immediate dispatch uh, and yeah, poor Jessime. yeah uh and just seemingly with no emotion sitting there for i don't know 80 years or whatever it was at the time mm-hmm. and just uh just a tear rolling down um that, yeah that was that was fucking touching and then you know no more ravens and to find that this one actually does stick because it's a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoy the shit out of that. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the voice actor is not lost on me. It's, uh, <laughs> that could have been done a lot of ways. And I'm not saying anything would be better or worse. I'm saying that was great by itself. Who cares? Yeah. Pat Oswalt was great. Goddamn right. I was wonderful. It was, it was, it was it, I was perfect with that. That was great. You know, the thing I bought the most is that after he said no more Ravens, this one bought him over. Uh Uh-huh. Like, this one won his favor. Yeah. But, you know, he's a hardline bastard, though, for for a good chunk of this show. It's really only, like, the last episode or two where, like, Lucian winds up, you know, with with the help of other people being like, yes, be a better person, you jackass. Like, it convinces him. Though we see like we see like these wonderful little bits of I'll call it humanity within Morpheus, <laughs> um, and it's one of my favorite Something changes. Something resembling sympathy. Yes, it's one of my favorite changes from the comic, and uh, and it's almost like the they. I mean, not even almost. Um, it is absolutely a bit where they like kind of made fun of the book, like in the second episode. Um, he shows up with, or he's nursed back to health by Cain and Abel mm-hmm. and, um, but he needs power and he's like, don't know, isn't there, there's, is there anything here that I created that was a part of me that I could reabsorb? Yeah. And they made it to be, it was like in the show, it was like, oh, it was Gregory and which is sad, but Gregory like sacrifices himself for his King and shit in the comic. Gregory does not, doesn't doesn't die uh that way um if he dies at all i don't remember him dying but um 
they're like, oh, there's nothing except for the letters of our letters of commission. And he absorbs that and, that, and that he moves on. And then Cain kills Abel. Abel wakes up, and uh, and Cain is like, oh, I got you a present, and it's it's a gargoyle egg. And then he winds up getting mad and killing him again. <laughs> In the second episode of so the show, you know, uh, Morpheus reabsorbs Gregory. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cain kills Abel. Mm-hmm. Sandman leaves a gargoyle egg and Abel, when he wakes up, he's like, brother, did you leave me? You left me this egg. And he's like, why would I give you a gargoyle egg? Like it just like, <laughs> like, why would I give you a gift? You jackass. Yeah. And it was just like, it felt like such a, uh, like s- such a jab at the comic. Like Gaiman was just like, no, that was a dumb thing. Why would he have given him that? <laughs> no, that made no sense to the story. There was no reason for it in that way no we'll we'll do it a different way yeah this guy's terrible don't give him that yeah so uh and it, it you know in in such a tumultuous time where we're like really fighting to see the humanity and dream in every episode and we don't get it a whole lot like we get we get his humanity his rage his sadness when jessime dies in that first episode and then when the at the first chance he gets, he wreaks havoc on everybody who wronged him. Yeah. And then the second episode, he genuinely feels bad about Greg, Gregory's sacrifice and gifts another gargoyle to Abel. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a god that's growing in, in certain ways, and uh, that's fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I love that they... they, they gave when you consider you know uh what the comics did i love how much uh they gave ethel mm-hmm. um in, in terms of her development um and john d I, I i really just i liked how much they built them up um dude a hope in hell was a fantastic episode like uh gwendolyn christie killed it as as lucifer yep uh, you know, feel free to jump in with anything you you want to say. I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just following you. I mean, I'm following you through the episodes. The uh, the I am battle was uh, it was glorious. I mean, it it's it was glorious in uh, you know in written form, but dear God, uh, that mm-hmm. that visual representation was fantastic. It really was, and you know, I. Uh, I love the shift from the book. I loved that in the, you know, cause in the book it was like Lucifer's just a, a stand, uh, like just standing over in the, like they, like Lucifer was so depowered <laughs> in a way in the book where it was like, Oh, things have changed. I'm not the only Lord of hell anymore. There are three Lords of hell. Yeah. And also there's this other demon and there's this, this other demon dude, some fly dude, and some other yeah. just dude, like Yelzebub and yeah. you know, whatever. And then there, uh, they're going to do the whole thing where it's like, oh yeah, this demon is the one that challenges dream and they have, they have it out and Lucifer is just kind of ha- chilling out watching. I thought this was way, way better. Like you don't like, I love the demons like, oh yeah, then I'm going to call Luc- Lucifer as my champion. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> That's awesome. And she, and it really gives, uh, it makes so much more sense for that exchange. Um, between them where it was like, Oh, have you come to, to, uh, admit the sovereignty of hell? It's like, you know, my stance on that. <laughs> <laughs> and my God, hard. Like, no, the, hard. No. What it's like the, the freaking like that. Uh, it's, it's amazing because there are like, there are these lines from the comic that they just like, there's so much, all the best stuff. They just put right in the show. And there's that, exchange between lucifer and dream where you know dream says you know uh what power does hell hold if those imprisoned here cannot dream of heaven Mm, that's beautiful and as he like walks away lucifer's like "Ah, i'm gonna kill that bastard you know (laughs) (laughs) i have to deal with that um yeah it really is like a that entire you know 
series of characters really is just mm-hmm. uh, like a philosophy course with whoever has the best point right now. Yeah. And I, some of the most horrific, you know, that battle gorgeous, being, you know, a, a really good instantiation of it. Yeah. And this is, this is my favorite iteration of hell that I've ever seen depicted on screen, by the way, just hordes. Yeah. It's just like bodies, like m- merged into each other, mm-hmm. making up the architecture. Um, one thing I do wish they had brought over from the comic was um, the f- the suicide forests, the forests that are made up of n- of people who committed suicide. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, ugh. <laughs> I got I got chills just now, like ugh, gross. But yeah, that's I, I wish they'd kept that, but because that's specifically disturbing to me. But um. Yeah, I, I I am just I am beside myself with how much I have loved this this series twenty four seven, somehow even more uh, disturbing than the comic, and I thought they would pull back. Mm, no, I leaned in. John at the diner. That was oh dear God, the diner. It was it was worse than the comic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're not wrong. Yeah, the diner was more graphic, <laughs> having seen it, than it could have been reading it. Yeah, and by, by that, uh, for as much as like that was more disturbing and graphic, I felt like the sound of her wings was somehow more beautiful than mm-hmm. that version of you know. Like I was just so taken aback by like how they just knocked it out of the park, dude. Yeah. I just could not believe it. Every episode, I'm like, I'm literally just sitting there almost getting aggravated going like, they're going to drop the ball. They've got to. (laughs) And they failed to. There's got to be something that I'm just going, got to go like, no, 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 no. They ruined it. But no, they, they did everything perfectly. I think like, um, and by the way, uh, I know she's been getting a lot of shit online. Uh, Kirby Howell Baptiste, who who played Death, and really, you're, they're just she's they're giving her shit because she's black, and and Death was not black in the comic. Of course, I've come confused because I was already always pretty sure that Death was Asian in the comic. <laughs> and <laughs> either way, yeah, get fucked. Yeah, I mean, as immediately like, as possible, just go ahead and get fucked. Yeah, I was just like, um, I, I just, uh, I, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. I don't, uh, it, did you, have you, did you see all that bullshit where they were like attacking Neil Gaiman for ruining Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Yeah. Because he, and uh, like, he ain't had a damn thing to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Power of the Rings. Or whatever. He ruined that by, um, suggesting that, you know, people who, aren't white might be in a thing Mm -hmm. in a fantasy universe. And then Neil pretty much pointed out, you know, I have nothing to do with this. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, even with people screaming about quote unquote, woke Sandman, um, it's almost worth it just to see Neil's responses. Oh yeah. Oh, he's like how he's tearing these people apart is just, Oh my God. This is fantastic. Yeah. It's glorious. Yeah, just go, just go if if you're so inclined, go go follow at Neil himself on on Twitter and just watch him systematically take apart these assholes. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, speaking of the sound of her wings, though, <laughs> I love this bit. Um, <laughs> he actually gets pissy with this dude <laughs> about being his friend, you know, and then and then winds up coming back. Uh, after he's uh, out of his imprisonment, that was that was nice. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I like it. Um. All right. So, how did you feel about uh the 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 doll's house, the the collectors, all of that, mm. the the serial killers? That was a lot of fun. The serial killer convention. It was. It was. Um. The payoff is pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it didn't work out well. For them, no. I mean, it shouldn't. Yeah, that's the point. Uh, the um, I enjoyed, in some capacity, that they had somehow made this an event 
that if they just changed the lettering of cereal, they were good. Yeah. It was a weird convention. But, yeah, the the payoff held in the parking lot from one guy. Mm-hmm. And I, I'll be damned, though, that the doll, the see, episode seven, uh, you really start to get a notion of how really charming and charismatic the Corinthian is. Yeah. You know, the most charming thing he did, the most manipulative, uh, well, I'll leave this other key for you. I'll come back in an hour, and uh, if you, I'll knock, and if you want uh, you know, want me to answer, I'll come in. If you don't want me, mm-hmm. but that was a that was a fun scene for a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. He was establishing a lot right then and giving her a lot of rope, but he had a plan. Mm-hmm. It didn't work out, but he had a plan. Yeah, naturally. Yeah, and I, by the way, I love Rose Walker. Um, they did, they brought her in, you know, less than halfway or more than halfway through the season. So she had less than half the season to win me over. And I think I was, you know, one over in the first episode, like they gave her such a heartbreaking backstory and, and really like drove it home in a way that made me care. I loved seeing her freaking brother, by the way, in his dreams in the uh, old Jack Kirby uh, Sandman costume. <laughs> of course. Um, I love how that played out. How, like, you know, the, he was accompanied by a nightmare who didn't want to be a nightmare anymore. Like, all of that was very touching. Played very, very, uh, played very well. And uh, the resolution of that at the end of the series is uh, touching, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. His skull. So. Uh, and the transference of said skull. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty good. So. I love the whole, like, can you hold on this for, can you hold on to this for me? Like, maybe one day, but also, I'm going to create these other characters. Mm-hmm. And I love how, like, I love how they looked. I love how they looked as he's, like, creating them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, like. Strange empty shells. I don't, I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm very, very pleased with how imaginative the show really was and how uh, it managed to capture and expand upon uh, and enhance what the comic did in a lot of ways, which is not very, is very rarely true of comic book adaptations and not something I would expect of the Sandman. Mm. I like it. There's so much there to work with, though. So, like, uh, it's, a, it's a very green set of grass. Mm-hmm. Speaking of green grass, <laughs> I was very, very pleased to, 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 for them to bring in Lyda Hall. I loved seeing, you know, her trying to stay in that dream with her dead husband. Mm-hmm. Um, I, won't, I won't go into comic book lore here because it's all very spoilery at, the, at that point about what all this means, but it seems like they're following suit with the comics pretty well. <laughs> nice. <clears throat> so, um, we wind up with, uh, in episode 10 with, with, uh, with Sandman, you know, letting nightmares become dreams if they wish. And, uh, being an overall pretty good dude. What do you think, um, about the 11th episode? <laughs> The surprise eleventh episode that dropped. Yeah, I think mm, the acting out of uh, what's his name, Rory. Yes, I, I, I know who you're talking about. Um, his name was Rory on Doctor Who. Yep. Anyway, his uh, Arthur Darville. Ah, God bless his him. name. I'm ashamed I didn't recognize him. But yeah, like the acting off that, uh, fucking phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, him just trapping a mood, uh, a muse, is is a fun story by itself. It is, yeah. <laughs> or buying a muse, basically. Yeah, I mean he could, he could let her go at any point. Yeah, but it was greed, effectively, that yeah, you know, kept him going. Poor bastard, though. In some ways, like jackass, terrible, terrible person, uh, deserved everything he got. But uh, also, like, man, you screwed up and grabbed the wrong muse. <laughs> yeah. 
man. And there was like so many times in that, in, in the, the Calliope story where you're just going like, dude, just let her go and she'll help you. Like you don't have to do. Okay. You're just going to go straight down that. Okay. Yeah. (sighs) And it was, it was hard not to take that lesson and go over to the cats. Like, well, the cats came first. They, they aired it first. No, no. But if you have enough cats, uh, the the whole point of that was if enough people mm-hmm. believe your story, then fuck it. Yeah, that's what it is. And I, I love the idea that like cats were in, were like the dominant species until a thousand humans dreamed that they that none of it ever happened, and it, so it didn't because that's the power of dreams. Mm-hmm. And just that's wait for it. Wonderful. Could go back the other way any day. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, going like. I I love seeing dreams show up to different creatures and different races and species, you know, uh, like so all encompassing is Morpheus Mm -hmm. that he can be a giant Panther. He can, you know, he looks African to one woman, you know, he just like, he changes based on who he's talking to, who he's appearing to, uh, I really love that idea. Yeah, and I don't know. It it makes you viscerally angry to like think about the cat thrown in the thrown in the river. Yeah, that was not a good time for us. It, it was a it was a bad time for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, well, we watched this on like the day that like our cat was at the vet, maybe not gonna live. No. Oh. And so we like came home. We're like, eh, let's get our mind off of this. Let's watch this Sandman episode that dropped. <laughs> oh. Hmm, that's oh. not gonna help. Not that day. It was a tough moment there for a minute. But yeah, I don't know what else to say. Like everybody did a fantastic job. Tom Sturridge, my God, that I still nominate him for the best casting that I've ever actually seen, barring nothing. <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to I don't want to go too crazy I, because everybody on the show is fantastic. No, it's not that. It's not that that's just the best casting for that show. I mean, that may be the, my favorite casting of all time is uh, him in that role. Hmm. I, I mean that hmm. truthfully. I mean, uh, the, okay. the, the weird sort of disconnected delivery, um, the, the droll, deeply baritone voice the entire time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way his face actually affected the character. Like it, it looked like the book. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his hair is not, uh, an advantage or a disadvantage. Like, it, you know, you could, you could get a wig, but <sighs> no, I wouldn't want that. If, if anything, I would have wanted the hair to be like more, like I said, more Edward Scissorhands, but also, also like animated with CGI a little bit. Yeah, like, more Burtony. Yeah, like that, I think I would have gone that way. But I also like can't believe we made it through the '90s without <laughs> like a Tim Burton claymation version of the Sandman. Yeah, it would have fit, and I think Burton would have would have done a good job. But probably what we have here, like, he's probably is... at home masturbating to the Sandman, going like, <laughs> "How did I not know about this?" I have no doubt that he has deep respect for the property. I have plenty of doubt, but only because he shits on comic books and acts like people who enjoy them are stupid. Ah, fuck it. It's Tim Burton. What do you want? Cognitive dissonance? I don't know. (laughs) Happens. Happens to the best of us. As it is, though, that is probably the best casting I've seen in a very long time. I mean, yeah, I, I cannot imagine someone fitting a role more perfectly. I mean, at the very least, he's right up there with Patrick Stewart as Xavier. Yep. You know, like it's just one of, it's just those like touchstone where it's like, Oh my God, you were born to play this. (laughs) Yeah. Like Mark Campbell's voice box in the Joker. Yeah. That was meant to be, you know, it's, uh, I'm just, I'm, Seriously, like I know I keep saying it, but every day I'm just like I think of the Sandman and just go, How did this even happen? I thirty plus years of 
Neil Gaiman saying, no, this isn't good enough. Right. That's how this happened. I've been reading a lot. I've been reading a lot of those articles. <laughs> right. If anything, uh, I love how he wrote his contract because apparently mm-hmm. he had some decisions. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, he also proved himself exceptionally with, with good omens. Oh God damn. That was so fucking good. So I cheered when Mazikeen showed up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, Mazikeen. I agree. <laughs> like I'm just very pleased with the whole thing the whole thing yeah I mean that said as much as I love Gwendolyn Christie which I do I think she was perfect for for what they were doing here yeah you want the people Tom, you want the other Tom ones Ellis, well Tom <laughs> Ellis specifically Tom Ellis could have done it I'm just saying he could have he could have I'm not saying you may not participate at some point just because it would uh, the scheme allows for it let's put it that way yeah it wouldn't. Uh, it would negate nothing. No, no. And it would contribute to a few things. Yeah. That said, perfectly happy with what we got. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was perfect. She was wonderful. Um, not gonna lie and say I didn't miss you know uh, Tom Ellis. Not gonna lie and say I didn't miss Matt Ryan as Constantine. But Jenna Coleman did a fantastic job, yeah, and I love this, was love this version. Amazing. Love this version. Yeah. Uh, apparently, there is some. Some talk about maybe a Constantine spinoff, so uh, a Joanna Constantine uh, show. I, I'm absolutely down for that. I'm good with it. I want all the things, mm-hmm. especially connected to this universe. Yeah. Somewhere so. Sheila Booth is already dead. <laughs> um, I think that's all I've got, though, as far as, like, you know actual getting into it like everything was perfect music was perfect cast perfect storyline condensed in a way that made sense but not at all condensed if that makes sense uh oh uh given the condensation like god the episode with death oh fucking yeah sound of her wings mm. if if you didn't have some emotions there I, I don't know what i can do with you i did uh, i <laughs> how did they put it in the show like is that all i get like yeah you were promised a life not not a period of time you know that kind of thing you were yeah yeah, yeah. you were you were promised a lifetime nothing more nothing less yeah there you go yeah uh that's fucked up and i love it yeah 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 i say that as someone who's never lost a child to sids and um dear fucking christ i'm sure i feel very very strongly about it if it was different yeah, but I loved how much, I mean, and, and honestly, that the comic issue was pretty damn perfect, too. Um, they very much almost went beat by beat there. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous episode, though. Mm-hmm. I just and, loved how relatable Death was to everyone that was coming into her jurisdiction, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, very was, comforting. Was, like that was part of what she said was like they just need a comforting voice, like uh, something to kind of transition them. Yeah, it is. It is weird because I've heard a lot of people talk about that issue specifically, and then and how it helped them uh, come to terms with death. Well, sure. In real life, and then you know, and now I've started seeing people on online talk about this episode in the same way and it did a very similar thing for me where it was just it's not a perspective that i'm unfamiliar with but um it has weirdly helped in some ways like my thoughts on it Mm -hmm. and uh for them to be able to pull that off and make people feel uh more at peace with the notion of dying a mere what was it <laughs> like the like two episodes after showing us hell and that hell that specific hell that particular one yeah <laughs> they still managed to make us feel some sort of inner peace about death after showing us that hell that's impressive yeah fair enough that is impressive also uh, at the end of uh, Collectors, I was very happy to to uh, imagine most of those people um, in that hell. <laughs> I get behind it. Yeah. 
So anyway, uh, yeah, very interested to see where they go with the Dream Vortex uh, situation. Uh, Rose Walker and whatnot. And uh, Lida's baby, which uh, Dream has, uh, of course, uh, said that he will take back at some point. I do love the moment in the uh, in the end where everyone basically solves the problem of the vortex without Dream. Mm-hmm. It he he starts to say, "I don't know, like why you exist." He only knows that he has to actually destroy her, him, mm-hmm. uh, to keep things going. He doesn't actually understand the origin. Yeah, I like that. I like the that mystery. I like that everyone else around him just kind of resolves things. And he ends up being this fun kind of character because he he has a role and he has so much power, but he mm-hmm. he he's impotent in a way. Like he doesn't completely understand why the hell he's there himself and what effects he makes and what uh, what things affect him. Frankly, like he's. He he's as much at a lot at a loss as any of us are in certain ways, but in his kingdom, you know, he's got some choices to make. And toward the end of that, or toward the end of the series, we uh, start to see that he's making decisions that uh, it, it him relying on other people is very touching in that way. Yes, I agree. It, yeah, he's a god. He learned lessons. How is that not a good show? Mm-hmm. You know what? Mm -hmm. I wish I could like see an alternate reality where, um, where we can keep, you know, we we can keep this version of the show in in our heads Mm -hmm. and, uh, and have it to, to watch, but also see a version where they cast Arthur Arthur Darville as dream. Oh, he'd done fine. Yeah. You'd love to see his take on it. Yeah. There, uh, there are a few people I would like to have seen the take on that, but. I don't know, man. I I don't think, and no hate, no hate to anybody. No, I mean, I just you know, I was scrolling through the ca- the the cast listing, and I saw Arthur Darville's face, and I imagined him pale with starry eyes, and I was like, "Ooh, that dude's solid." I mean, yeah. I mean, honestly, you could have taken most of the characters from Doctor Who and thrown them in that character, and they they'd have been fine. Yeah, he the Dream is a little like the Joker, where I kind of just want to see everybody's take on it. Yeah, that's fair too. Like I would have, I would have loved to have seen Tennant do it. I would have loved to have seen Matt Smith do Dream. Oh, dude, Matt Smith! <laughs> <laughs> I knew we were gonna get there. I was just waiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Age, age, be damned. How much do you want to see Peter Capaldi as the Corinthian, though? No, goddamn. Um, no, age is irrelevant <laughs> for that. Or as Doctor Destiny, for that matter. Mm-hmm. You know what? He would have made a good death too. Yeah. Mm, that'd been fun. Yeah, like it it doesn't really matter as far as that goes. And frankly, <laughs> there's a reason we uh constantly refer to the Doctor Universe because oh dear god, they cast some fantastic people. Absolutely they do. Those actors are uh first rate altogether. Yes, they are. But then Pretty I see like always. I see scenes where like, you know, let let's go back to, you know, Thor and uh would not Christian Bell have made a good Corinthian? Because I think he would have. Yeah. I mean, he was basically Corinthian in American Psycho, just without the bitey teeth. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. By the way, do you uh, did you see that <laughs> thing that Neil Gaiman uh, retweeted where the woman, this woman said, uh, you know, my uh, my husband just told me a joke. What was the, uh, what is Corinthian's favorite high, or interstate? I-80. <laughs> And, and she said, uh, she's like, I must divorce him now. Do you want him? <laughs> <laughs> I did see that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. The whole time I'm watching Sam and I'm going, I'm looking at Boyd Holbrook as Corinthian and going like, where do I know that guy? He's so familiar. He was like, he was, he was in Logan. He was like, he looked exactly the same. He even had like sunglasses. He was just always chasing after Logan. Shit, now I gotta watch that again. Yeah. I don't I I have no recognition of that guy. I I just he was there, he was fantastic, and I I have no notes. He even had the same voice, like he even he did the same little draw where he gets in the back seat with you know of Logan's limo and has a little conversation with him about being Wolverine. Mm. 
You know, he <laughs> he was Corinthian in that movie, man. Lovely. Um, it took me forever to like figure out that David Thewlis was Ares. Like I was just like watching Doctor Destiny, going like, eh, <laughs> I know him, I know him, mm-hmm. I know him. Oh, Ares! <laughs> Did you notice who Murph Pumpkinhead was? No, oh, Hamill. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I need more of that character. <laughs> I enjoy. He was in it so very briefly, but I enjoyed him so much. He could have his own like Monsters Inc. universe in that universe, and it it would be fantastic. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, they did that whole well, like, comic him, series called and, The Dreaming. Well, yeah, but like do do that, and then uh, just introduce a couple of the characters that uh, Dream was like building on the beach. Uh huh. We got a whole series here. It's fine. We're good. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter that, you know, Gaiman came back and kind of nullified the comic book, the dreaming. You can just kind of do that anyway. <laughs> doesn't matter. Yeah. Just tell a little. I mean, if this is big of a Look, hit. If, if we're going to go meta, like he literally wrote a thing where the nightmares go off and do their own thing. Mm hmm. He can't. He can't, you know pretend to control all of his ideas yeah. either. I'm pretty sure there's a, there's like a ver- there's something in the comics Sandman universe stuff that's been more recent where I think they said the stuff that was in the dreaming comics was fiction within the dreaming <laughs> or something like someone in the dreaming universe was or someone in in the dreaming was writing fiction that was some of the comics. Yeah, I, I can't remember exactly how that goes. As one as want to do. Forgive me. Uh, Naturally. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I do wonder if they'll um, go for it on the uh, the Tori Amos uh, delirium thing. Because, you know, Gaiman is friends with Tori Amos. And she was the inspiration for delirium. So, I'm kind of wondering if when they actually cast delirium, if they'll actually try to stick to that closer. I'm good with that, or <clears throat> the audible version is Kristen Shaw, and mm-hmm. I can deal with either pretty happily. Yeah, that would work. I don't know what Tori Amos is, is even like now. Like, you know, I don't think I've actually seen a picture of her in 15 years. I I don't know either. Like, she might be. <laughs> I still listen to her I mean, music I, I, pretty regularly, but yeah, I don't know. She's. I, I I guess there's no, nothing that says that the dreaming can't look older, or not dreaming. The endless can't look older, but her style doesn't seem to be the same style as that version of of Tori Amos had. You know what I mean? Like Delirium did not look like that version. Yeah, she looks a lot more refined now. <laughs> That's fair. Back in back in the nineties, she was she was a little wild looking. Yeah. But I'm sure they're going to knock it out of the park, man. I There's mean, even a fun bur- uh, uh, Bob's Burgers episode where, uh, yeah, that's the that's the catch. What? <laughs> it's hard to describe because uh, I'd have to try Clearly. to sing it. But there's a Bob's Burgers episode where, like, it's clearly Tori Amos. Okay. Performing. And I think okay. some kind of festival where I believe, if I recall, they were a food truck amongst many other food trucks and uh, it was contentious. Let's put it that way. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, if you're good, I think I'm good. Yeah. I can get out of here on that one. Thank you guys so much for listening to DC on screen. Uh, I implore you heavily to uh, go check out Sandman season one. On Netflix, get the, get get them some hours watched. Hopefully they'll uh, they it just went back up to number one, uh, so uh, hopefully we get a season two without them having to uh, switch streaming services. Which it's been successful enough that I think if they Netflix does cancel it, it'll go someplace else. Uh, but anyway, uh, DCOnScreen.com for every episode, and um, gosh, until next time. Keep that DC on your screen. Bye. Our intro music is by Jason Goss and Michael Shackelford. 
Michael's band, Galactic Engineers of Magnetic Sounds, or GEMS, can be found on SoundCloud and Bandcamp. Visit DCOnScreen.com to find our Patreon, merch, contact information, and every episode of the show for free, including crossovers we've done with other podcasts. DC On Screen is a maladjusted production. For more from me and Jason, including sketch comedy, vlogs, parodies, and our improvised web series Hey Guy, visit maladjusted.tv.